Yeah, so I'm from IKEA. Uh, I uh, work as a system, a senior systems engineer uh, at uh, IKEA Retail, also known as uh, the Inca Group. Um, so what is the Inca Group exactly uh, doing? It's, uh, it's operating close to 400 stores at, uh, in 32 countries. It's also uh, responsible f to uh, to be employing uh, 170,000 uh, co-workers. Um, there's some f numbers on the uh, 2021 um, uh, in terms of the um, visits to the uh, IKEA website, including uh, downloads. Uh, we have three point or sorry, 4.3 billion visits to the IKEA website. And we also have around uh, 700 million visits to our stores. So it's quite a bit of um, an enterprise. Um, if we're looking at what I'm part of the digital organization within uh, um, uh, Inca. It's uh, handling uh, 3,000 employees so that is doing all of uh, the technical development that supports um, most of our business, uh, including uh, um, um, I've lost it. That's good. Um, it's been a while since I've been on stage, so that's maybe why. <laughs> um, but anyway, we also like a lot of other people looking for um, um, people to join our forces to actually deliver on our, our journey. Um, so let's go into why we're here today. It's actually talk about um, the project that I'm working on. It's, um, it's part of our modernization of, uh, efforts uh, in terms of uh, modernizing our enterprise that is a lot of other companies or enterprises is in the same situation as us. Um, we're not just uh, modernizing uh, the IT landscape, we're also modernizing the, uh, the business as a whole. We're moving towards more circularity and, uh, and reusability of our products. Uh, but in terms of the technology, we are uh, moving to from like a, um, a lot of operational focused uh, operations to more agile and DevOps uh, approach. Um, as part of that, uh, we're also moving a lot of our workloads from, um, from our data centers into the public cloud. Um, but it's not all uh, workloads that is uh, movable uh, in, in our situation. We are, since we're operating in that many markets, we're also operating under regulated uh, environments so that there's a ton of that that needs to be handled in a good way. So we're setting up this um, private cloud initiative in our data centers in order to get uh, the same kind of uh, operational uh, uh, experience or developer experience that you will have in the public cloud. Um, so uh, what is needed from the pub private cloud initiative is that it should be easy to use, just that you would experience with any other public cloud. Uh, it, not, it needs to have a cloud-like consumption model uh, in our data centers. Um, and also, it, we need to build trust uh, to our consu consumers of the private cloud. Uh, and consumers is in this context is uh, not uh, IKEA customers going to the stores. It's our developer community within Inca. Um, so we are uh, also one of the uh, initiatives that is uh, really uh, needed for, for this is that it's uh, multi-tendency, uh, meaning that uh, multi-tendencies uh, within different uh, uh, developer communities uh, in Inca. Uh, and also we are moving a lot of, uh, uh, putting a lot of effort in the zero trust uh, initiatives so that we can uh, run uh, application with confidence uh, in a multi-tendency environment. Um, and from this private cloud, uh, we um, 
looked at different options uh, like this is uh, like uh, I've, I guess a lot of enterprises has been down the OpenStack uh, in this, uh, platform, but we, we're kind of building this environment to support our needs of tomorrow, not, uh, not as such as a cloud uh, provider as such. So we, we decided on moving uh, or leveraging the Kubernetes uh, infrastructure uh, initiatives. Uh, so uh, it gives us this possibility of actually extending the APIs a lot. Uh, with different types of CRDs, uh, so that we can get, uh, uh, for instance, we can run uh, Kubebird uh, as an uh, as an operator to handle VMs in this environment. There's also uh, a very de highly demanded uh, interoperability between our current environments uh, that is being built many years ago uh, and and this environment. So we have a need to actually be able to coexist these environments for a long time going f uh, uh, before uh, the uh, old systems has been uh, modernized in order to fit this uh, uh, new environment. Um, so from our f design thinking point of view, um, it's, uh, it's an open source first platform, uh, meaning we kind of went away from dealing with traditional vendor uh, approach where they deliver uh, something that we can use and operate. Uh, it's been uh, needed at least for some, um, for some time that we actually have uh, lots of flexibility in terms of picking and choosing from, from the uh, different components in the uh, CNCF uh, initiatives um, so that we can uh, gain speed and flexibility that way. Um, and it, we have been looking at how um, a, a lot of the uh, public cloud providers has been doing their infrastructure with the uh, regions and availability zones. Uh, in our context, an availability zone is, uh, is a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and then we can have one or more in a, diff in a region. Uh, we have load balancers as a shared uh, uh, resource and the same with the storage. Uh, and um, since we are building this environment for uh, being ready for tomorrow, uh, we're also looking at uh, running this as an IPv6 single stack. Uh, and also uh, we're looking at multi-home pods in order to support uh, some of the more traditional uh, workloads um, and to tie these uh, zones together, we're using the Cilium uh, cluster mesh um, because it provides us with some uh, uh, nice uh, integrations to, to running uh, this multi-cluster environment. Uh, we have been trying to do uh, the same uh, type of thing before with, uh, with CoreOS. It actually supports having a cross-cluster uh, lookups and uh, you can do uh, writing your own uh, network policy operator to make that work. Uh, it seems to be a, a, a lot uh, easier when it's all built into the Cilium uh, 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 tool. Um, and the last piece uh, for this environment is that we're doing PTP routing within our data centers. Uh, what it gives us is a lot of uh, flexibility um, and you can actually uh, move your workloads around much easier in our opinion and also this uh, gives us the possibility to scale out uh, the environment both uh, in terms of the number of nodes and clusters but also if we're running low in the data path uh, we can uh, scale up uh, or add an additional layer of uh, leaf switches uh, in the top of this uh, that will bring us more um, um, bandwidth uh, within the total um, environment. Um, why is this uh, important? It's because uh, we're moving from like a scale up solution into a scale out. Uh, we also need to have the possibility to scale out uh, networks um, uh, and and with this setup, we can actually fairly easily get our, uh, we're using uh, egress gateways uh, as well to, to connect uh, to the legacy environment. Uh, we can use these egress, uh, egress gateway IPs fairly easily to, um, to get this uh, all tied together. Um, and then you get global uh, pod routability, pod IPs, uh, and what's not to like about that. 
Um, and then we're looking at more into this uh, networking and the psyllium piece as all why people are here today uh, I guess. Um, so I guess this uh, Thomas had a, a slightly more updated version of this um, but uh, in, in essence like uh, we think that or see that EBPF is um, is gaining a lot of traction uh, and we since uh, we're building this environment for tomorrow uh, I think it's uh, it's a it's a right time to actually address uh, some of the challenges uh, that we see uh, today uh, with with actually uh, um, some of the the technology that is uh, really picking up today so it it, be it becomes uh, actually one of the key things for us as a team is that it makes it bit, uh, easier for us to deliver a trusted environment uh, when we are uh, going in this path. And, and the next, uh, so at least it's no secret that uh, our team is uh, not really developers or kernel developers. So we have uh, teamed up with Isolvent uh, in order to co-create some of the features that we uh, uh, were, were missing uh, in, in the, uh, the Cilium product. Um, firstly, we, we started out uh, this project of the private cloud started out uh, two years ago, more or less. Um, in that setup, we were leveraging our uh, on-prem load balancers uh, with Hive uh, and its uh, operator in order to control it from the Kubernetes cluster. Um, it's uh, it's more or less a traditional load balancer setup where you, you access uh, the cluster from through an F5 load balancer outside uh, your workload. Um, this is um, a fairly a fairly straightforward environment, but it, it brings uh, um, it also brings the uh, the need to actually run your load balancers outside, uh, either on a physical device or through a VM uh, and and this environment that we're building is actually also meant to run inside our stores so it should be able to run at any scale so from uh, a small environment with one cluster to a larger data center deployment. So um, we're looking at the uh, XTP, uh, uh, the express data path uh, that allows us to, um, to actually bring the load balancers uh, back inside uh, the Kubernetes cluster um, and what uh, we were missing in this uh, early adoption phase uh, was actually that we are running uh, as I mentioned uh, with multi-NIC uh, uh, ECMP through the BGP uh, integration uh, and when we started looking at Cilium it didn't support multi-NIC uh, XTP uh, so luckily we we worked on that together with uh, Isolovent uh, to get that in to our um, stack. Um, we're not quite there yet. Uh, we, we had other problems with uh, XTP. Um, we found that uh, apparently it's not it's not that simple uh, to get it working, uh, even though you we're looking at uh, some of the uh, supported NIC uh, or network device drivers uh, we ran into this kernel bug that uh, we're currently working with the uh, the vendor to get resolved uh, it's uh, it locks up our nodes uh, but for now it's uh, doable at least to run our current testing and continued work on moving forward um, the multi homing piece uh, is um, it's a different story. It's uh, where you actually can get uh, multiple IP uh, networks uh, attached to your uh, pods inside your Kubernetes environment. Um, this is interesting uh, for us uh, to support some of the uh, the multi-tendency uh, promise or problems that uh, uh, what you want to say about it. It's uh, you can easily end up in situations where a, cons a tenant will actually consume all of your bandwidth with uh, doing uh, things like uh, data migration or uh, AI workloads uh, that uh, consumes a lot of bandwidth to, uh, to consume data. Um, there's uh, a tool uh, that's uh, 
tumultuous that supports this. Uh, it's a uh, it's actually um, uh, in our opinion it, it brings also a lot of operational complexity as it's not just uh, one networking component that you need to run. You need to run multiple different ones to solve your problem. And then from a uh, zero trust slash uh, multi-tendency point of view, it doesn't really bring uh, network policies. Um, so we, again, we, we teamed up uh, so that we can actually run multi-homing uh, inside Cilium. Uh, it's uh, currently a proof of concept that we are doing and it's, um, where we have a possibility to run two different sets of networks, uh, the default Kubernetes pod network and then a, and a different network with the same kind of um, uh, 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 feature sets. Uh, so you can have service discovery and network, uh, network policies on your, uh, on your secondary uh, interface and in our BGP backend, we can then route this uh, through different NICs and different paths in our networks in order to uh, not have network conjunction. Um, we also have uh, the possibility to have this uh, network manager that was also discussed earlier. Um, and there's been some work uh, put into that that uh, makes it even better uh, so that we can actually even further tighten or secure that uh, the different tendons in our environment doesn't really uh, break things. So that's uh, really nice. Uh, and in terms of the IPv6 uh, single stack, uh, we think that the time is right to actually move into that direction since it's a new platform, but also since uh, IPv6 has been around for that, that long. Um, and other projects that we're using, uh, uh, KubeWord, for instance, is also bringing IPv6 single stack support. Um, so, how, so currently we're not really routing IPv6 within our data centers. Uh, so, we have some, some outstanding uh, things that we need to address. Uh, in, for instance, we need to isolate this environment so that we can actually get uh, NAT64 and, and 4.6 uh, working. So we're working on that feature together with uh, Isolovant to, to actually be able to, to have uh, the translation happening at the, uh, at the load balancer node so that uh, the environment can run IPv6 and, and everything that is communicating to it will be addressing it as IPv4. So um, this brings us uh, closer to be able to roll out RPv6 uh, uh, moving forward. Uh, and to kind of uh, connect all the things, uh, it's, uh, it's quite simple to actually um, connect your network from your Kubernetes environment into your BGP environment. Uh, uh, we're using BERT as the routing daemon on our nodes uh, and, and it has uh, a nice integration to local host. Uh, that's uh, like uh, for those, uh, it's, it, you cannot really do multiple uh, PGP sessions out of a single node so you need to kind of correlate them uh, on your node so that's uh, the integration piece. Um, for the observability piece, uh, I was actually uh, thinking of doing a demo, so hopefully um, that will work. Um, mm -hmm. uh. So as uh, mentioned, we were um, in implementing this dual NIC uh, XWP, uh, XDP support uh, in order to actually uh, look at how things were, were, were going. Um, and how do we then test this when your uh, old time sysadmin is trying uh, to use your TCP dump and it shows you nothing? Uh, it's, it's quite interesting. Um, I think um, like uh, our setup is, uh, is is that we have um, 
uh, these nodes in in the It would have been easier with a different mic. Hey, Karsten, I'll hold it. It'll help. <laughs> I am not above this. Keep that. Yeah, that was actually why I was a little worried. A little, a little. Ah, it's working. Our VPN was just yeah. two minutes before this, and so. Um, so the uh, the node that I'm on now is actually one of the clients, um, and that's not it. Uh, that's not that's not the client. Sorry, that's the uh, it would have. Live demos are hard, people. Give them a hand. Thank you. We've been out of practice at this. It's going to take a while. I don't know if all of you remember the excitement and butterflies of standing on stage. They've gotten worse after two years of no practice, at least in my opinion. Ready? Yeah. I think so. Um, the top screen is uh, my client, and when I'm trying to look at um, in my button uh, left screen, look at TCP dump. That's at least my go-to tool when doing network debugging. Um, uh, apparently, when you query, like it's not doing anything in particular. You cannot see. It's actually getting this uh, request coming through. Um, so it's going to my node port uh, service, service uh, and then it's hooked into XDP. Uh, so that's not really going to give me anything uh, in particular on that. Uh, so luckily, Cilium has this tool that's uh, um, that's the uh, Hubble Observe that uh, will actually give you some of that back. Um, and you can use your Hubble Observe to actually look at traffic coming, uh, the Hubble record. That's my mistake. It's uh, uh, You can record the, the, the traffic flow coming in. Um, and you can see that for some reason, Something else happened. Yeah, that's. Uh, I think uh, it's a, a bug in the system somehow. When you start this up, the recorder, um, it actually needs to get to this stage um, in order to to not show things and re be recorded. So you can see that you're picking up the the packages in this uh, scenario, and then you can get back to um, your actual. Um, so I have a, a cheat sheet or not. I cheated a little bit like in the uh, um, and pre-baked your cookies uh, in order to not uh, spend all your time on downloading things. Um, uh, so if you're looking at it um, and you're at least that's my go-to to, uh, whoa, that was big. But anyway, you can see the traffic from our client uh, going to um, the uh, node that hosts the, the node pool. Uh, and then you can see that traffic is actually leaving towards the, um, the, the pod IPs. Uh, so if we exclude this uh, one in order to see, then 
that, that will go. Um, so the source I, uh, I MAC address is uh, is one of the NICs on this machine. Uh, we can exclude that just to verify that it is actually using uh, also a different um, source. So you can see that's a different MAC address. So in that case we can verify that we are actually leveraging both uh, NICs uh, leaving this um, Yeah. So that was kind of uh, the uh, the demo. Uh, the one thing that we st we are still kind of investigating a little bit is is actually how do we get these uh, data into um, some more convenient tooling than doing a uh, Hubble record and then looking at them in via Wireshark. It would be really convenient to have them. Uh, we're using the Grafana stack to do uh, metrics uh, together with uh, Prometheus but it would be really nice to have uh, a way to actively to get this into to this stack so that we can actually support our developers in, in their, uh, their journey on being self-serving on uh, also networking components. Uh, so yeah. Sure. Do I have a mic? Oh, I do have a mic now. Here you go. Hi. Hello. Um, I wondered, uh, you mentioned uh, BGP uh, pod advertising to your network. I was wondering, I, I also sold like the small uh, YAML uh, base there. Uh, so I was wondering how is that integrated with, with uh, that in rest in the infrastructure because there has to be a, like a service discovery and different things. You mentioned the bird daemon. How, how is that integrated? Um, so, so bird is connected to our BTP uh, infrastructure. So it's advertising the IPs to to the to the switch uh, sw switch BTP daemons. Uh, and in that case, it's uh, it's routing the traffic. We are uh, using the uh, service type load balancers uh, to actually run services uh, inside our network um, and that's where we are um, um, needing the uh, the net 64 and net 6 uh, 5 uh, 4 6 uh, in order to actually do the integration uh, perfectly okay other questions No. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I love that everybody's helping me. This is awesome. Hello. Uh, how do you handle multi-tenancy in this, like you mentioned? Um, so we're doing multi-tenancy based on namespaces, uh, and uh, then we're doing uh, installing um, the. Um, the uh, uh, network policies to in, in order to uh, ensure that everything is blocked by default. Uh, so that's kind of our current way of thinking. Uh, in order to ease it up a little bit, we are actually thinking on leveraging the uh, namespace uh, high wiki uh, plugin. Okay, thank you. Ooh, more questions. I love this. Active audience, you in the back, think of questions. Thank you. Um, can you please talk more about the uh, Core DNS cross cluster plugin? Uh, sure. Uh, so, Core DNS, at least when we did it, it has a cross uh, cl cross cluster plugin that you uh, you need a service account in the other cluster uh, in order to, for it to do this uh, service discovery. Um, and then you can actually specify uh, what we did was to have uh, different types of uh, cluster domains. So we had uh, different types of cluster domains and we could leverage uh, that for our service discovery. Um, and then you, of course you need to have that cross cluster functionality in all your clusters. Uh, the second part of that is also having your pod network routed. Uh, but I guess that's a different story. Thank you. All right, so now I'm looking at the back half of the room. Any of you have questions or want to point me to someone that you know has a question but hasn't raised their hand? No? 
Okay. Oh, hands here. I missed the middle bit. Um, so how do the developers interface with Cilium? How can they use Cilium to observe traffic and to debug their applications? Um, yes. Uh, so we, we're using Hubble uh, and we're allowing all all team members to view what's in Hubble. We also uh, uh, have been using uh, the Hubble hotel integration to actually uh, have network traces uh, inside our Grafana Tempo instance so that they can look at that. Uh, we, we have briefly been uh, playing around with actually doing metrics based on uh, traces uh, and see if we can actually uh, further enrich uh, data and also um, give them uh, much more insights into specific uh, networking uh, components. Okay, I think we've got this last question. Thank you so much, uh, Karsten, uh, for a great presentation. Um, I was wondering about uh, your multi-homed uh, network interfaces and uh, how do you handle uh, asymmetric routing uh, for that use case? You said you were using uh, ECMP together with uh, the network stack, or are you only using one interface at the time? Um, so, yeah, we're using ECMP in order to to gain uh, that it can pick any path, basically. So it doesn't really matter since it's routed uh, network. Um, so either way, it uh, like it can pick any interface, both in and out. Uh, uh, our ad, uh, announcements is uh, for the multi-home. Uh, we are announcing different networks on different uh, NICs. Um, so that's how we are handling that. So, so uh, Pod is never using both networks at the same time. Um, so, like the the use case, uh, the initial use case for the multi-home uh, thing is to be able to, uh, if anyone has been trying to run uh, like Elastic Stack. Uh, there's uh, HTTP transport and then there's the uh, transport uh, layer. And we want to separate those two so that the search queries goes on, uh, on, in on the separate NICs, uh, whether it in our environment is the client facing interfaces and then all the, the transport is handled on the, uh, the backend networks. Uh, and, and you can handle that with being able to have multi home uh, pods. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Karsten. Can everyone give him a big round of applause? <clears throat>